Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about, and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Today I'm with Dr. Glenn Davies, who's a general practitioner in Taupo in the middle of New Zealand. I'm down in his place, and we spend quite a bit of time exploring what he's about. This is a real character of a guy. This is a guy that you will see has fundamentally changed the way he practices medicine and approaching the whole lifestyle is medicine angle. He's reversing diabetes in his community. He's got right hold of it. You're going to love this. This guy is special and where our doctors need to be heading. So Grant Schofield here with Dr. Glenn Davies. Can you just say who you are and what you do? So I'm Dr. Glenn Davies. I'm, I'm 53. Last time I looked, I'm a GP in Topol. And where do you work? It's Topol Medical Centre. Um, the other thing I do is I'm um, involved in the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine and I attempt to be a lifestyle medicine practitioner. Okay, so I've got the, the, the big five questions for you, Glenn. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. So, first of all, uh, you work in the health system every day. Mm-hmm. What's good about the health system? Okay, if, if I had a car accident and... The paramedics would turn up and they are incredible. They would take me to an ED or an emergency department and I would get the top quality care. If I needed to be in ICU, I would be just looked after so, so well. If I needed surgery, acute surgery, then it would it would just be fantastic. So that part of the healthcare system is done so, so well. The part that's not done so well is chronic care management. Um, we've just got that all wrong. Most of what I do in primary care, we're just doing very, very badly. So what is chronic care management? So, um, I was was just going to be a little bit facetious in answering your your question. Um, Chronic care management is everything to do with insulin resistance. But I know that wasn't quite what you're asking me. Chronic care management is obesity, overweight, type 2 diabetes, um, ischemic heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's. It's basically, I think, 70% of consultations in primary care are for chronic health conditions. So they've already got these? These are conditions that people have already got. So this is distinct from a child with an ear infection, a child with a sore throat, uh, a sprained ankle, uh, a fracture. Right, so and those latter ones you you think we deal with quite well. You've got an ear infection, we can do something about it. Uh, um, well, yes and no. Yeah. Um, I think we're actually getting better because um, you're bringing up the topic there of um, inappropriate antibiotic use, yep, yep, and, yep. and I think we're actually better than we were at that. Um, so saving antibiotics for when they're really required and not using them willy-nilly as we have in the past. Apparently they don't work for viral infections. <laughs> Are you still, the people coming in looking for antibiotic prescriptions? Yes, but I think people now expect only to get antibiotics when they need it. So what do you say? Um, so if I recall the guidelines for ear infections, it's if the pain has persisted for more than 48 to 72 hours. Um, then it's appropriate to use an antibiotic in an ear infection. Otherwise, it's not. There's guidelines for sore throats. Yeah. Um, so Marion Pacific um, treat otherwise probably not required. Mm-hmm. Okay, back to the chronic conditions. So we're talking about the really the treatment and management of those. What about the prevention? Is that part yeah. of your job? <clears throat> That's a fantastic question. It, it really should be. Um, but... I think we're appalling at prevention. It should be the responsibility of primary health care, but we're still functioning as ambulance at the bottom of the cliff rather than preventing these conditions. So what does a typical day in a general practice look like for a doctor in general practice? So um, general practitioners would see somewhere between 
24 to 40 patients a day. Um, consultations are generally 10 minutes to 15 minutes and people will come in with their presenting complaint and we'll do the best we can to manage it. Um, and that presenting complaint could be anything. So I think that's one of the challenges of general practice. If, if you're a neurologist, you're going to see a small number of conditions most of the time. I, I think the challenge of general practice is you could see someone with Alzheimer's disease who's got behavioural problems, you could see a child with a sore ear, you could see someone with a sprained ankle, then you could see someone with uncontrolled heart failure. It's it's that ability or, or, to... Or metastatic cancer or anything. Or a new diagnosis yeah. of cancer or somebody concerned about HIV. You know, that's the challenge is um, you really have no idea what's coming through the door. And I guess having the... Is that the, part of the excitement of it all as well? And the... I, guess, I guess it is, but, you know, if you think about... A specialist um, really, um, they know a whole lot about a small amount of things and it's absolutely fantastic that they know everything there is to know. For example, back to our neurologist, everything there is to know about Parkinson's disease. The challenge for the general practitioner is just to know enough to be able to make the diagnosis, mm -hmm. but you can't possibly be all over the topic of Parkinson's disease yeah. like, like the specialist can be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it makes it exciting. Um, it, yeah, it really does. So what's changed over the years from when you started? You've been practicing for how long? I've been practicing in total for 22 years. And so what's different now than five years ago, 10 years ago, 22 years mm. ago? About 18 months ago, I developed a real interest in lifestyle medicine and that has dramatically changed the way I practice general practice. So when I when I think about lifestyle medicine, I'd say there's two types of medicine. There's pharmaceutical medicine and there's lifestyle medicine. So pharmaceutical medicine is what I used to practice. Um, I would make a diagnosis and then I would run through my head which is the best pharmaceutical agent to use for this condition. You and, know, and write your prescription and that was it? Write your prescription and if it wasn't fixed by a drug, you'd probably fix it with surgery. You know, that was basically the entirety of it. Now what's completely... So that, just, just hang on, that's interesting. So in a day's practice, in that mode, the pharmaceutical mode, that's 90% of what you'd be doing? I would say over 90% of what you do. Um, listen, examine make a diagnosis, and then which is the most appropriate medicine to use in this situation. That, that was general practice. Wow. And what's changed? Now um, my life has become much, much more difficult because now instead of actually making a diagnosis and prescribing a pharmaceutical, now what I do is I start asking why. You know, why did this person develop this situation? And then you ask why again and why again and you start thinking about the determinants of the end result you start thinking about their stress their sleep their cultural environment particularly their diet but you know like that's just opening when you keep it to pharmaceutical and medicine it's just so simple and clear isn't it and it takes 30 seconds to write a prescription right you don't open that door you start opening the door and wondering you know this person is a refugee, an immigrant, what what's what's happening for them in their lives? Um, what supports do they have? Is there a language barrier? Um, are there illnesses that they've brought with them? You know, it just starts. I don't know. It just opens things up so much that you start. You know, it could almost become overwhelming to start doing that. And then what happens? How does the consults go on from there? So you've asked the whys. So. What I've concluded is that there is probably one cause of most of the chronic health conditions that we um, that we see, and that's insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia. Yeah, and generally that's a consequence of a high carbohydrate diet. And I think that of all these things that we talk about in lifestyle medicine, we talk about stress, we talk about sleep. Uh, we talk about exercise, we talk about um, relationships. Nutrition is the big the big factor. Nutrition's probably 90% of it. Yeah. And you sort people's nutrition out 
and I think most of these other things improve by themselves. Yeah. And the key to understanding nutrition is to understand insulin resistance and the role of insulin. Yeah. And going back a step, the role of carbohydrates causing hyperinsulinemia, causing all these downstream effects of um, insulin resistance. So you can't control your blood glucose. You end up with high amounts of insulin in the blood. And that both of those combined are risks for eventual... Or everything. For everything. Yeah. So high carbohydrate diet, insulin goes up, and insulin's a switch. Okay, this is the clearest way to think about it. Insulin's a switch. You switch it one way, high levels of insulin, that's um, anabolic, that's yeah. about building. Yeah. So Which we need from time to time. Which you need, and um, if you're going to the gym and you're wanting to build muscle, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You want to build. And then you switch the other way, insulin levels are, di- are low, that's catabolism, and that's when you rebuild, and that's when you renew. Yep. And when you apply that to thinking about cancer, you know, when you're destroying cancer cells that have popped up, that's not going to happen in your building phase, that's going to happen in your phase where the insulin levels are low. Yep. And the big problem is that people do not get their insulin levels low for a majority of the day which needs to happen for health so how do you deal with this you see you've got someone coming in they're presumably expecting a prescription mm. and then you've gone why 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 yeah and you're thinking around diet and lifestyle how do you now transition to doing something about it okay so well one of the one of the tools that's really useful is to be able to measure fasting insulin and fasting glucose yep. and then there's a um, online calculator called quickie that has a very good correlation with the gold standard for measuring insulin resistance. So ideally I'd like to calculate what the quickie index is. If it's above 0.45, then um, you're normal. If it's below 0.3, you have diabetes. And if it's below 0.399, you have insulin resistance. And looking at the United States statistics, 86% of adults in the USA now are insulin resistant. So 86% of the adults in the US will fall into that range on the quickie index. So to me, that's really powerful because I can say to people... And do you think we're much the same in New Zealand? I'm sure we will be because you look at HbA1c, you look at obesity, it seems to be pretty much the same everywhere around the world, doesn't it? Although New Zealand seems to be... um, well, we're we in bronze medal position on the obesity stakes, are we? Yeah, uh, possibly predominantly because of the large amounts of Maori and Pacific yeah. people that we have in the country. Uh, if we can come back to that Maori yeah. and Pacific at some stage, because I think what we're talking about here is really relevant in that um, situation. Yeah. Mm. And so, so, but the, the, yeah, are so, you eventually say, hey, look, I'm, I'm actually not going to give you. A medication, or do you yeah. do the medication as well? Or I, this is what I want to do. What, yeah. what happens now? So what I'll what I'll do is I'll say you've got obesity, um, you've got type two diabetes, and instead of diabetes being a condition that will slowly get worse, and eventually you're going to go blind, need a kidney transplant, and your legs are going to get chopped off. Now I say, well, that's not the case at all. This is something that you, by taking responsibility for your diet, can turn around and you can now be normal. And so I, I, I say to people, I explain that it's all due to the high carbohydrate diet. They need to get the insulin levels down and I'll talk to them about um, a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet. And then I'll give them some resources. I've... Is that what they're expecting? No, hell no. <laughs> but I was just going to talk about the resources. Um, I came across this very good book, um, and we seem to have about 200 copies of it in our practice. Um, and it's um, it's by, I keep forgetting his name, he's a, he's a professor of um, public health, AUT. Oh, okay, so you give it away, what, the fat books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah, so, we, <laughs> so that's what we use. But, but, you, our... but that's been a reasonable resource for you. That's been a fantastic yeah. resource. So we give away um, copies of What the Fat, and we've also got another resource that we've prepared. Yeah. And I give that to people, and I just say to them, you go and study, you go and learn this stuff, go and look at every YouTube clip you can find and learn everything you can about low-carb diets. And, wow, amazing results. We've now had 36 people that have reversed their diabetes or pre-diabetes. So 36, and that's from probably zero. 
And that's in... What do you mean by probably zero? What does that mean? I don't think we reversed anyone's type 2 diabetes before. And now we're getting people that are going from the diabetes range into normal HbA1c ranges with using low carbohydrate, healthy fat and ketogenic diets. Right, and that's the sort of results that we're seeing from the actual trials as well, the Verda study and these types of things yeah. that Jeff Volokh and Steve Fini are doing. Yeah, and yeah. this is this is kind of real life. This is this is and this isn't big interventions, you know, this isn't big trials with lots of resource and researchers. This is little old me sitting in my room and saying, This is a really good book, why don't you go and read it? Yeah. And here's a printout which lists the foods you can eat. Go away and do it. And then they come back, I recheck their HBA one C and they've gone from diabetic to pre diabetic. And that's it. That's all we've done. It's it's like low-cost, simple general practice intervention. But you're being a little bit shy here in many ways, aren't you? Because you've also got a, a, a social media and actual physical group yeah. that comes together. And, and that yeah. is interesting because that goes beyond normal practice. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, for about a year, we've been running a group called Reverse T2 Diabetes Topol. Um, there's a 1,000 people on the Facebook page. Um, and we meet once a week and we discuss either a topic um, or we do our beginners keto meeting where we just discuss the basic science. Some of the topics we've done have been awesome. We've, um, we're about to do one on Alzheimer's. We've looked at the role of ketogenic diet in cancer. Um, um, we've had a a uh, man who's done a carnivore diet for four years. Yep. Um, we've tried to use Mirai as much as we can to, to host the events. Yep. Um, yeah. So you see that as a, quite a big change in practice, really. That's part of your practice now, is running social yeah. media groups and meeting people in the community yeah. and not at your practice. Yeah, what, and what, I must, what's that like? I must admit I didn't have a Facebook page before I started this, so, <laughs> um, so that's a whole new world. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I love it. I I just enjoy that whole environment of um, being with a group of positive people, and, and we've had up to 120 people in one of our meetings. Wow! I was expecting 10. Yeah, it's always a bit disconcerting. Well, 10's good than none, though, right? Yeah, <laughs> but it's disconcerting when you intend to talk to 10 people and there's 120, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And so, time will go that I talked to you. You said something which I found profound. You said, oh, I've only just learnt how to do my job. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, this comes back to that comment about pharmaceutical medicine versus lifestyle medicine. Um, with pharmaceutical medicine, I think generally you're just um, fixing the symptoms. With lifestyle medicine, you're actually able to cure the cause of the problem. And, and that's the difference I'm actually... A healer now, whereas before, I don't know, I was a first aider. What was yep. I doing before? I was just treating people's symptoms, which has a role. Yeah. Of course it does, but, but now I'm actually a healer, which I think is what we all hope to be as doctors and health professionals. So what do you say to other GPs who, who are still thinking about that move? Um, well, I'm involved in promoting lifestyle medicine. I think lifestyle medicine, for example, the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, that's a fantastic group to get involved with and you learn the the skills and develop um, some of the tools to practice lifestyle medicine. Um, Hopefully people are going to see the results, like 33% or 33 people have reversed their type 2 diabetes and they'll go, well, I want to get in on this. And and a lot have. A lot of my colleagues really have jumped on board with this but others haven't yeah so there's also a whole community here a mm. marai what you know that you're, you're perfectly involved with tell us about their story and what's going on there because that's that's interesting isn't it yeah um waitahanui is a small community about nine kilometers south of Taupo. um you probably everyone's probably everyone in new zealand's probably driven through it it's a 70k um, 70 kilometer an hour area. There's about 100 houses there. Um, in the past, it's been um, a low socioeconomic area with a lot of problems, but 
Now there's some amazing... Oh, albeit a nice spot. You're lake front and then you're up into the Watanui yeah. River and the beautiful, uh, forest yeah. there is just... Beautiful, yeah. yeah. And um, and there's 100 houses there and they've built a new marae. There's amazing leadership in that community, outstanding leadership. And they've adopted a ketogenic diet and they're now measuring their weight loss in tons. No longer hang in on, kilograms. So, hang on. so the whole community's gone for this approach? The whole community. How's that well, happened? I might be exaggerating to say the whole community, but I would say a majority of the community, including the catering at the Marae. So, so, so the matter of some public events and, and the sort of food that's served up there, which is pretty common. Yeah. yeah. So previously, I think Marae have had a bad reputation in the past for the food that they've um, served at, um, at Tangi, for example. Now Waitahanui Marae is um, serving ketogenic food at um, Tangi. Which, which is quite a change. That really is quite a, a big difference. And this, this whole community has got, got behind this and they've even got their own language um, around keto. They talk about the keto kopapa, kopapa meaning um, vision or mission. Yeah. Um, they talk about cheeto, yeah. um, which is when you fall off the ketogenic uh, wagon, they talk yeah. about cheeto. And they all support each other and, um, yeah, really amazing. Is it? Uh, why is it so interesting to you? And why? What I find it, I find it quite special and motivating. But what's interesting to you about it? Um, well, on a on a personal note, um, I lived at Waitahanui when I first came to Taupo. Um I was married at Waitahanui, and um, and so I have a, a strong association with with that community to begin with, but. What excites me is that don't you get despondent when you see Maori at the wrong end of all the health statistics? You know, we are wrong end of all the health statistics. Yep. And now we're seeing a community that's at the right end. You know, their weight loss is out of this world. And, and what I think this comes down to is that Maori have only had exposure to sugar and refined carbohydrates for 250 years. You know, Captain Cook bought sugar and refined carbohydrates to New Zealand 250 years ago. And, and Murray, it, didn't, it didn't help. It, it's the cause of, of so many of these problems. And 250 years is just a blink of the eye in terms of genetics to adapt to a major environmental change. I've read that it takes 20,000 years to adapt to a major environmental change. Europeans have had exposure to agriculture for 10 to 12,000. Maori have had 250 years. What's that? Five generations. It's just not enough time to adapt. And that's why Maori do so poorly with refined carbohydrate and sugar. But why they do so exceptionally well when you take, when you take it out. They do better than Europeans when you take it out because of that fact it's only been 250 years and that's why I get so excited you know and that's why we see these results you know um, we um, uh, you yourself and I we did a little venture down to the pub and the scrub didn't we well the pub and the scrub is a, is a sight to behold I tell you <laughs> yeah. it's fantastic so the pub and the scrub is a, a, a converted house which is um, down a gravel road beside the Waitahanui um, River and we went there on a Friday night we were so warmly welcomed, weren't we? We um, really, really warmly welcomed. And um, I can recall you um, talking to um, a gentleman and you, you'd had a reasonably long conversation with you and you came back and um, Bill said, oh, he's lost a heap of weight. And you went back and talked to him and you said, how much weight have you lost? And he went, oh, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you came like, back. It was 48 kilos yeah, or something, yeah. I remember, yeah. And he was just so low-key about it, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've lost a bit, you know. And you yeah. said to him, "How have you found the keto?" And he went, "Are oh, you good?" Yeah, and yeah. He was quite under, under understated, understated about the whole. Absolutely understated. Uh, yeah. Tummer, I think his name was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the thing about that though, and then I, and then another an elderly woman from the robot pass and she's and I said oh what's the story of she goes oh yeah, yeah he's, 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 he hasn't got a big gut anymore yeah and that was the end of the conversation yeah that's yeah. Sylvia <laughs> Sylvia that was and yeah. and um, the thing is that in Waitahanui it's becoming so normal to lose 45 
30 kilograms that it's just not a big deal yeah. there's a little um proverb and i'm really sorry i can't say this in Toro, but it's something like um the kumara doesn't need to tell everyone that it's sweet yeah and um they're just down there doing it they're not making a big yeah fuss. they're, quite they're not they're not telling everyone yeah. and and their their message is that we're quite happy for people to come to us and we'll share this information but we're not going to be standing up there um, lecturing about it, yeah. you know, which is perhaps a little bit different from the way from, we might do it. The way we might do it, and so, I've got to respect it. So the the older guy there, Bill, was it Bill? That yeah, was Bill. Yeah, yeah. So he, he was interesting because when you got talking to him, I was like, you asked him why he was doing it, and his answer was, he's like, well, I'm now the second oldest here. I've had I had four brothers. All of them died before they were 59, mm. and he said we just it's not acceptable. Yeah, we're we're not doing that anymore. Yeah, so we've changed. that was. I thought that was very powerful. Really, really cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really love the way they're doing this in such an understated and humble way. But they are literally measuring their weight loss in tons. Mm. You know, it, that that blows me away. And and you're not hearing about this in the media. No either. one's putting up. And also, it hasn't really been a public health initiative. They've just got on and done it. That's what's so cool about it. Yeah. There's there has been no money spent on this. You know, not not a cent. They've they've just got on and done it. There's another um, maybe changing the topic a little bit. Isn't it so cool how every single person now has access to the highest quality of information um, if they spend the time looking for it? And everybody can learn about nutrition. Everybody can work out for themselves a nutrition plan. That's the beauty of the internet, and that's what they've done down there. They've, yeah, and because there is a the, the, there's more often than not it's the exact opposite argument which is don't allow people to access information and give them more information because they just they'll get too confused but that hasn't been the case no i yeah that 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 statement alone i think is 100 percent wrong you know people can access information people can digest it understand it interpret it and they can become experts in in a field no longer is health the domain of the doctor you know health is the domain of everybody we're not there now to hold the information and tell people what to do we're there to coach them and support them on their health journey that's what's different it's quite a different role isn't it you're a coach yeah Yeah. your role is to encourage and support and sometimes maybe interpret because it because when you look on the internet with any symptom you've always got cancer haven't you yeah whatever symptom you look up you've got cancer yeah, or, or like i was self-diagnosing myself with adult adhd the other day oh, but I've, yeah. I've got that too <laughs> <laughs> that's where she had <laughs> yeah yeah no that's i've forgotten what we were talking about. <laughs> all right that's a good chance to switch on let's just talk about you a bit more about um the the lifestyle behaviors you might do so what, what do you do um, to keep healthy i was actually thinking about this earlier today since i became a lifestyle medicine practitioner i have become far less healthy than than i was before mainly because of all of this work that we've been doing it does take quite a lot of time and energy yep. and so um i think i've probably doing less exercise um yeah. although you're pretty fit aren't you um, oh i have been fitter but yeah, I do. I do. If I can't run or mountain bike, I will always go for a walk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I always try, but yeah, that's it's just that all this work sort of takes up quite a lot of time, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Diet, diet, um, totally different. I, I am absolutely sold on the concept that you have to keep your insulin levels um, under control. And I will eat the amount of carbohydrate that I need to to control my insulin. And how I do that is I'll periodically measure my ketones. And if there are some ketones there, like I don't require myself to be at 0.5 and above, but if there's some ketones, I know that my insulin level is it's under low. control. It has, it has to be. So I'm managing my carbohydrate intake to maintain some level of ketosis. And that's because because um, ketones and, and, and insulin are on a seesaw. Yeah. You can't have high insulin and ketones yep. and if you've got ketones you can't have high insulin so that's just a really simple way that i can monitor the main determinant of metabolic health which is insulin okay so what uh, a good day's eating in the last few days what, what, what might it look, have it looked like um 
My breakfasts, um, I will try and have an omelette for breakfast. Um, sometimes a little bit lazy and it might be eggs on paleo toast. Yep. Um, otherwise, I'll use a, a grain-free granola with Greek yogurt and berries. Always try and have some berries every day. Yep. Um, that'll usually be breakfast. Um, lunch, I would try and do a salad yep. um, with some protein. Um, chicken usually yeah and then dinner's just um protein and and veggies yeah um if i do feel like snacking it'll probably be dark chocolate yeah that's and i'll drink water yeah coffee yeah a couple of coffees in the morning is that what you do yeah um no i don't actually coffee makes me really buzzy yeah um if i and you're already quite buzzy so that's (laughs) (laughs) and if i do um if i do have alcohol um the the pure blonde low carb um, beer. You like those? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then I guess uh, maybe on a Friday night it might be a um, spirit with some soda water. Yeah. Mm. So under that's con- the under food. control. Under control. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's changed over the years. Yeah. Well, I I used to being a ex athlete, I used to be totally into the carbohydrate um, loading and the you know excess carbohydrate approach. Yeah. Um, and I've turned way away from that, especially after hearing um, yours and Dan Plew's talk um, on... Um, oh, and athletic performance. Athletic performance oh, so on a low-carb yeah, yeah, diet. Yeah, yeah, So we're all... Totally so, convinced. Yeah. yeah, we're both aspiring athletes, but yeah, we're, we're probably getting past our use by that in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you find hardest? You touched on that with some of the time for exercise. What, what else? What don't you do well that you'd like to do better? Um, I would just like to do eat i think i do a moderate little bit of everything i would just like to have more focus on um on doing all these lifestyle medicine things and probably just time to sit and do nothing that's um, yeah right not even necessarily meditation i'm I'm just really talking about those breaths you have during the day where there's 10 minutes where you're not reading you're not watching a youtube clip you're not reading something um you actually just sitting or and those that's that's probably what i miss you know you sit down and you go oh, i can return that text or i can um, ring someone you know actually just to have the time to just sit there for 10 minutes and just sit yeah you know and then also you go this active relaxation thing you know i'm, I'm going to deliberately watch the show on netflix tonight yeah. so that i relax you know maybe just sitting there for a few minutes in the evening and just be bored. doing nothing being bored being, being bored's bored is underrated isn't it being bored i was actually when i was in wellington this weekend i was thinking i used to go and visit my grandparents and they had this bay window that looked out over the airport and um in high tai tai yeah and it used to rain and the rain would come blasting in there and as a child i had never been so bored in my life i don't think they had a television and i would sit there in that bay window for hours after hours doing nothing, just watching the occasional plane in the rain. And now I think back, that's one of my fondest memories. <laughs> Absolutely one of the fondest childhood memories I have, yet I hated it. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was destroying me. But Oh, that's, uh, a, that's a little bit like the, uh, the A, B and C class family holidays. You know, a, going to Venice and doing all these things and B, doing this and C, just going to the local camping ground. Yeah. And, and it, you know, yes. it turns out an end. Yes. What are kids love? Yeah. C category holidays. Yeah. That's what sits in their memory. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. They were, they were, you spent time with them. You were left to your own devices. You mucked around. Yeah. 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 yeah it's astonishing, isn't it? So, what else? If if you had to sit down, it's not a it's not a doctor conversation now, but it's just you're talking to some other people, which you you are now. What do you say to them? What's your best advice about a healthy lifestyle? So I would. Always, there's just really one key piece of of advice, and that is it's all to do with insulin, and you've got to keep your insulin levels under control. You have to ingest the amount of carbohydrate or restrict the amount of carbohydrate to achieve normal insulin levels. There is nothing more important than that, and it's that simple. You know, that that is the key piece of health advice for everyone, and if everyone did that, I think we would have amazing health statistics. So that that thing alone will make all the difference. Awesome. Mm. Well, thanks. Is there anything else you want to say while we've got you here? 
Um, I think I mentioned that that book by Grant Schofield is quite, <laughs> quite useful, but um, we had 200 copies of What the Fat um, donated by um, a very generous um, donor, Wayne Richmond, and and that's kind of what got things started. And and that book is absolutely superb as a as an introduction to to what you know, healthy lifestyle is, particularly the low carb um, diet. I think if every single person in New Zealand could have a copy of that one book. I think we probably would have solved most of the problems. But um, it's interesting though because Wayne uh, wrote back to the both of us. Yes. With some, uh, his he was quite generous in donating the and buying these books. But now he's become disenfranchised with the whole approach, and he's actually quite critical of me in particular on two things that we had an interesting discussion about. Let's just go. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so so Wayne. Um, is one of the most intelligent people I've um, ever come across, and he um, he's solved some very very complicated chronic health conditions of his own um, through learning. Um, he spent about four years um, researching these uh, conditions, like um, the gut microbiome, um, irritable bowel syndrome, which he was uh, suffering of some. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. Yeah, just metabolism, and and he's worked a whole lot of stuff out, and and what um, he was um, critical of was the comments about um, protein, um, and does protein cause a significant insulin rise, and do you have to limit the amount of protein that you have on a low carb diet? And I think, um, and, and in what the fact we were saying, that's probably a good idea to do that. <clears throat> yeah, and, and probably now, probably since. We've moved a little bit on that. Yeah, and um, I was just talking about my my latest hero. That's that's after you, of course, Grant. But, uh, oh, but Benjamin Bickman. Benjamin Bickman, who has some amazing YouTube clips, and I think in his laboratory he's really answered this question. Um, if I am quoting him correctly, he's saying in a low carbohydrate environment, protein has zero effect on insulin. In a high carbohydrate environment there's a 40 times increase in your insulin levels in response to a protein load. And I think I think that's really the piece of detail that we've been struggling with yes. um, in this in the ketogenic um, environment. And I think he's really nailed it. It, yeah. it depends. Yeah. So protein can raise your insulin, and at other times it doesn't. It depends on the, the context. context. Yeah. And, the conte- and what we're doing, a low-carbohydrate um, uh, diet, you wouldn't expect to find protein causing a large increase in your insulin levels. And, and also protein itself is quite satiating and those sorts of things has that going for it. Yeah. So sort of leverages hunger. and Yeah, and a lot of people also are not eating enough protein, are yeah. they? Like we're talking about 2 grams per kg. Yeah. And a lot of people, particularly elderly, are not getting even close to that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the second thing, so that was interesting that he raised that and we're actually quite glad he did. It gives a chance to sort of keep changing your mind, which we should do as practitioners and mm. scientists, right? Mm. And the second thing he raised was about the value of vegetables at all. Yeah. Um, so I've just, the book that's open um, at the moment is um, The Plant Paradox by Stephen Gundry. Yes. Um, I don't, have you read it? No, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. Because um, I've, I've had um, patients of mine who have turned their irritable bowel symptoms around with this and when you when you're in this environment this this ketogenic uh, environment you are challenged all the time you know if you think of my journey i spent 20 years re- reinforcing the message that um, you had to avoid saturated fat and you had to uh, eat large amounts of whole grains and um, you know the usual, usual message dietary guidelines and then i would have been doing that what five to ten times every day so that is so reinforced in my brain then to get challenged with all of that and to actually have to turn your mind and now to be teaching what appears to be the opposite of that yeah you know that's really hard but then you get challenged even further you know when you when you get a carnivore you know we had this um talk in our group from a um, local man who has been a carnivore um exclusively carnivore diet for four years you know, and when and appears to be extensively healthy. Well, when 
you know, this challenged me. And when um, I hadn't met him before, when I came into the lecture, I was wondering what this man would look like, you know. And here's the 68-year-old guy who does 68 press-ups every morning. He's was lean and he's buff. He's going to add one next year when he turns yeah. 69. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's lean and buff and clearly his brain was working really, really well because he wasn't satisfied with PowerPoint as a medium, so he integrated it with another program and he designed his own um, presentation. Pre presentation format to give this lecture, you know, and he just won the club championships at golf, yeah. you know, so clearly his brain's working well, his body was working well, his coordination was working well, and he was just... He was eating a purely carnival diet, and that challenged me. I'm going, okay, you know, yeah. And then I've come across The Plant Paradox by Stephen Gundry, and then again, you're challenged because, you know, you and I, we we know that above-ground vegetables are just so health-giving and such an important part of this diet, but then you get challenged by something like this, and I, I think it's about keeping an open mind, being aware of your cognitive dissidence, um, meaning your resistance to information because you hold a belief so clearly. Yeah, for that to be wrong, then there must be something wrong with you. Yes, and and that's a challenge for everyone, including scientists. But I don't know. I think a lot of doctors. You, you ask me a sort of a question like sort of what's wrong with medicine. I think doctors are at risk of becoming lazy. I think they've been told that you are the experts in the field of health. And you were told that maybe 30 years ago. And I think a lot of doctors have just got lazy about their ongoing learning. Yeah. And some of them... Haven't kept up. Haven't kept up. And their cognitive dissonance prevents them from looking at new information. And so is the new information here, that, like, for some people, some reason, for some vegetables, they, mount a, they might mount something like an autoimmune response to, in, to yeah. eating them. Yeah, and actually, that's causing ill health. And to yeah. for those people, yeah, for whatever reason they've developed those intolerances, stopping that might actually help. Is, you that, know, that's, um, is that the theory? That's the theory. I've I've actually been so challenged by this that I had to put it down because yeah. um, I'm, you know, it starts making you think. You know, well, what am I going to eat? You know, <laughs> and and I I haven't quite got my head around the thought yeah. that I might personally become a carnivore. So you know, like I I put it down because I was challenged, but. The idea basically is that a gazelle doesn't want to be eaten by a lion yep. and a plant doesn't want to be eaten by an insect. And there's there's a variety of chemicals in the plants that um, are insecticides. Some people, if they're very sensitive to those, they, they may have an immune response to it is basically the idea. And that could cause problems. They could cause sort of irritable bowel type symptoms or autoimmune conditions. Um, I suspect it's a very small number of people, but... Yep. You know, I, I think we have to be open to this idea. Because I, I it also could be true for people who those those insecticides, those poisons, their mild harm to other people might be the benefit, the big yeah. benefit of vegetables, right? That's yeah, the yeah. idea of hormesis. Hormosis, yeah. Hormesis. Hormesis, 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 hormesis yeah. is the word. So the, yeah, yeah. The, like, it, it damages you slightly, but you build up stronger yeah. because of that. Yeah. Which is, is mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> Just challenged all the time. And I guess being open to the, the challenge and, yeah, open to it. I think we'll finish there. Mm. Be open to the challenge. Thanks, Glenn Davies. Yeah, thank you very much, Grant. Next episode, we're talking with almost Dr. Cliff Harvey and how he's approached his own health, his mental health, and his research on low carb and ketogenic diets. This podcast is brought to you by Precure. Prevention is cure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. If you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Together, we can change medicine for the better. Change medicine for good.